this whole big set put in front of you, but no, um, no instructions. What can the average person do with this? The whole set. What? Burn it. Burn it. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Put it away. Put it away. Mm. Make shelves. Make shelves, eh? Yeah, yeah, that's where you can find them. You can probably put a few pieces together and make some shelves, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, how many of you have built an IKEA furniture? Like, like they're supposed to be the easy ones, right? And yet, you know, even if you look at the step-by-step -step instructions, it is painfully slow and difficult. Hmm? So, why are step-by-step -step instructions and practical steps helpful to us? You know, you have, you have a pile and you have the completed projects. Why are steps in between those helpful to us? Yeah. They, they give us the intermediate places. Makes complicated tasks uh, a little bit easier to do. Yeah. Every, every step is typically a complete operation. There's, there's nothing that assumes, mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't jump two steps ahead. It's every, every step is like a complete step and you can move to the next one. Yeah. Good being. The sequence is also important. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yes, I miss. Maybe somebody else said the word is progressive. Yes. Mm. Yes. And, oh, yes, Jackie. Each step is important in order to reach your goal. Mm -hmm. If you miss a step, you can't accomplish your goal. Yeah. It will be a barrier or a difficulty. Mm. So each step is very important to get to the goal. Mm. Whatever that may be. Yeah. It's to build yeah. a house, a boat, go to heaven. <laughs> And see, so you're hitting on exactly that point, because I think what is true for, um, for building is also true in our spiritual lives. I want to think, like, how are practical examples helpful in our spiritual lives? It's one thing for someone just to tell you, well, you should be praying, right? How, how is it helpful to have steps and examples of someone actually praying? Showing you what to do. It's someone to say, hey, be a Christian. Okay, but what does that mean? How, how are practical examples of being a Christian helpful to us? Hey, Mr. Huang. I think we can see the objective situation of the practical examples. Mm -hmm. When it's just a study of spiritual life. Mm. Yeah. To help us see like, what we're supposed to do. Victor. Something you can follow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Paul said very clearly, follow me as I follow Christ. He, he sent Timothy to be an example of what he would do in their place. And it's one reason I like church history. I love church history. I love reading the stories of old dead men and women of the past and how they struggle. Because one thing they show me so often is how to struggle with sin. I love this quote from a young pastor in Scotland named Robert Murray McShane. He wrote, learn much of your heart. And when you have learned all you can, remember you have seen but a few yards into a pit that is unfathomable. As Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He said, learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Christ. He is altogether 
lovely. He, he, this is an example of some of the specifics we should do. And, and, and that seems like such a trite thing to say, but it's very important. For every look of myself, take 10 looks at Christ. And it seems to almost say at times, like he's saying, take a blind look at your weakness. Like, like don't look at your weaknesses. Get over yourself and look at Jesus. But that's not what he writes. He goes on to say, let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart so there will be no room for folly or the world or Satan or the flesh. He's making a great point. Like when it means to fight that darkness we see in ourselves, we have to look at Christ. And when we see him, we see someone who exposes our sin and replaces it with the Holy Spirit. And he writes consistently about that. You read his, his autobiography and his journals, and you see a man who's like, when he saw himself a sinner, he prayed, show me Christ to be a greater Savior. What a great example. How do you practically respond to this? And, and I want to say today in Luke 3 that John is giving us a path for repentance or he's first to his own people, but also to us. He's not just saying, repent. Okay, sorry guys, that's all you're getting from me. Um, he is saying, here's what repentance looks like. Here is the intermediary steps between his statement and Jesus, because he's preparing the way. So um, we're gonna talk about this tearing down of easy believism and the true call for a faith that works. We've seen John, how he was born, how the miracle that was his birth, how he was placed in time by all these important people, how his ministry was defined and a fulfillment of prophecy, and now we finally get to his words. And in those words, he tears down easy believism, he calls for a true faith that works, and we won't get to it, but he points to the one who is the object of faith. Sound good? So he, he starts off in verses 7 through 9, giving a warning to the crowds. The crowds come to him. Luke 3, verse 7. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not say to yourselves we have abraham as our father for i tell you god is able from these stones to raise up children for abraham even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees every tree therefore that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire so all these people, this is actually a picture of a gathering on the Jordan River, but all these people are gathering to hear him. They're like, we want to be baptized by you. And he calls them what? Okay, so when you first read those words, remember you can read them the first time, what, what are your impressions about John and what he's saying? Is he nice, harsh? Is this a loving thing to say? Is this turning people away? Like, what, 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 what is this? He's not careful. He's not even hedging what he says. Yeah. He was um, bold and aggressive. Very, yes. Yeah. What's the phrase? A bull in a china shop? Bull. Bull in a china shop, yeah. He uses the same way. Yeah, we'll get there. Because he does. He says the same things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it could almost, we could interpret it incorrectly and say, hey, John, these people are just coming to try and be baptized. They want help and you're calling them snakes. But I don't think that's what he's saying because look at the next verses. Verse eight says, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. Um, do not begin to say we have Abraham as our father. So how do these verses tell us that these people are not just coming saying, oh, please help me? How do these, I ask? 
Mm -hmm. what, kind of, what kind of response? Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, in verse 10, even some of them say, what then shall we do? And we'll talk about that in a minute. They didn't he, like himself. Yeah. Especially some of them. What's he calling them on? He's not just calling them vipers, calling them name. He, he's saying they're doing something wrong. What are they doing wrong? They believe their righteousness and their heritage. Mm hmm Yeah. Which means, what's happening right now? There isn't repentance. Yeah. There, there's words, but not a life to back it up. Yeah. Yeah. So the first thing he's doing is he's calling them to not put their faith in baptism itself. You know, we can see he's calling them vipers because these people are not unknown to John. You will remember last week we were comparing Matthew and Luke. And Matthew, in Matthew 3, verse 7, it says something slightly different. It says, he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism. And he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath of come? Matthew brings out the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Luke is just saying the crowd. So perhaps, if we put these together, we can get the sense that the religious leaders are leading a bunch of people out to baptism because this is the new spiritual thing to do. Like this is, this is the, you know, pietistic, wonderful thing that we're supposed to do because we're good spiritual people. And he, they lead them in there and he calls them on it. Not contradictions. Right? And, he, and he calls them vipers, right? I love this quote from R.C. Sproul says, These are hardly complimentary words. No wonder the ministry of John the Baptist was short. <laughs> like, of course, we know the result. He was killed by King Herod very quickly. Um, and, and look back at verse 3. Where is he right now? Luke 3, um, verse, um, verse 3. Where is he? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talked about how the Jordan has, it, it's a large river, but on either side of it, there's lots of um, valleys, and it's a very dry area. And you know what there's a lot of in a very dry area near the river? Snakes. So he's giving them an image that they would totally know, because they're all over the place. And the term that's used here is one that can be used for any number of poisonous snakes. But he's basically calling them self-righteous sinners that are trying to slither out of the grass because of, they knew a fire was coming. Jesus said the same thing. In John 8, 44, Jesus said, You are your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's will. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. John 8, 44. Like Jesus knew who he was talking to. John knew who he was talking to. Uh, said it before, I'll say it again. This is not the only evangelistic opportunity given in the Bible. And so not everyone gets these words. But in this situation, it was necessary. Like these, these are people who are not seeking baptism because they're sorry for their sin and they're trying to repent and change, but they're basically trying to buy off God with their spiritual acts. Yeah, it's a political act, right? There, there is no repentance. There's no life change. And, and this has happened throughout history. This is not anything new. J.C. Ryle, I, I'm enjoying this great book by J.C. Ryle. See, that's why I keep quoting from him. And, and he's talking about the English Reformation. And before that, in the time of England, uh, there was popery. The Roman Catholic Church ruled. And one thing that existed in the Roman Catholic Church were images. And he writes, 
The images worshipped were often gross cheats as well as idols. The relics worshipped were monstrous and absurd as the images. As to the bones of the saints, there were a whole heap which had been venerated for years, which proved at length to be the bones of deers and pigs. So people would come and they'd worship, or they wouldn't call it worship, they'd say we venerate, which is basically worship. They worship these bones, they oh, these are the bones of the saints, these are St. John's bones, and they were deer and pigs. Hmm? And he said, all these things the Church of Rome knew, they connived at, they sanctioned, they defended, they taught, and they enforced on their own members. He says, this was the state of England, and the English reformers were raised up. That they did things to try and make God happy, like they went on pilgrimages and they did, um, they, they venerated these bones because they were spiritual acts. But they didn't actually have to change their life at all then. We, we talked about the immorality that existed among the church leaders even at that time. So John is calling them to their biggest concern. He says they need to be concerned about the wrath of God. This is what you need to care about. The wrath of God is the term anger, or gay, which is turned wrath or anger throughout Scripture, and, and it's God's judgment. God's right judgment when someone does wrong. Paul, trans, uh, Paul comments on this in Romans 9, 9, 22, saying, God, desiring to show his wrath and make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy. So God gives wrath. Anger justly against those who have done wrong. And this phrase probably could be translated, um, who has shown you how to flee from the coming wrath by submitting to baptism? And the implied answer is, I haven't told you to do this. Because if I had told you to do this, I would have told you to repent from your sinful lives. And, and so he's trying to keep their minds on what is most important, their own sin. Right? In those days, Israelites were waiting for a political messiah. They wanted someone who would deal with Rome and make their political problems go away. They wanted Herod and Pilate and the Roman soldiers removed. So Jesus is coming, and John is sent first to get them ready for their need to focus on the spiritual. Make sense? So how does that happen today? How do people do spiritual acts but actually ignore sin? How do they do spiritual or religious acts but ignore sin and the need to repent? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I am picturing too many that that is, that is true I mean, of, right? You know, I yeah. mean, there's a number of ways that you yeah. could be at an outside of abortion to living under the guise of, of Christianity or Catholicism, and you could be ignoring your own sin. Yeah. Okay. Baptism. Mm hmm. Yeah. There are plenty of people who today still who are like, oh, I'll just get baptized and I'll get baptized again and again and again. Yeah, it is. Oh, it's okay if you do. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of buy off God by doing these good things. Anything else? 
yeah. Hindu co-worker. She builds, she sends me pictures of uh, the shrines that she makes to the, to the various pantheon. Yeah. It's, I tried to throw the question out there like, hey, what, what is this accomplishing? It's kind of, kind of hard. Yeah. Impress, impress the gods with my work. Charitable, to, yeah, with my money, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the the Bible is full, especially you read the Old Testament prophets. They're constantly addressing the issue of Israel trying to play both sides, where they'll they'll worship God and they'll come and bring sacrifices, and he's like, I don't need your sacrifices. And there is coming a day when the Lord will judge. Zephaniah 2 verse 2 says, um, The day passes away like chaff before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. God's anger is coming. But, okay, I have a slight um, warning if you get upset at these things, because there are a group of people who go around today yelling that, God is angry with you, right? They, they come out and they have these signs that come out here and they say things like, I'm so glad that um, September 11th happened. Let more children die. God hates fags. Um, plane crash, God laughs, things like this. And I've had, I've had my friend, my pastor friends, they've come to their churches and hold up signs. Is that the people that say they're Baptists? Yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is a bad West, Westport. Very distracting. Yeah. And so John is calling them vipers, but he's not just saying that, right? Because what does he offer in verse 8? He's saying not just you are vipers, but there's a, solution. there's a solution. How is that different from this kind of statement, this kind of just God hates you statement? How is Even yeah. If they were, that's a terrible lead in. That's a condemnation. Yeah. All condemnation. No hope. And John is very quick to say that's not what he's doing. He is offering hope. There is a path out of this. There is a path of rescue. Make sense? Very different. He says, bear fruits, right? Like, like, have a fruit that's in keeping with repentance. He has the ministry of this change, which says there is a way to change. Um, and, well, if we remember, there we go. Yeah. So we do have two trees. So he says here, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And it's a good reminder because a tree produces the kind of fruits that it produces, right? It, it's, if it produces bad fruits, the solution is not to take some, go steal some good fruits from your neighbor and, you know, take them onto your tree. The answer is, I need to change the kind of tree I am. I need to change my roots. I need the cross. It's, it's the heart. Chris, the gospel always says that there must be a change at heart and that God must change me. So when he's calling them to produce fruits of repentance, he's calling them to change who they are, which is impossible. He's calling them to see that they need to change, that they need the Savior. And, and he does this by stripping away some of their false hopes. Because we saw he said, you know, um, do not trust in baptism, but also do not trust in family history. This is, they're, you know, instead of depending upon their, their religious acts, they are depending upon their religious connections, that they'll be saved because of who they are. Uh, we know, of course, Abraham, big family tree of Abraham, right? and that they were part of his tree. But he says, do not say, 
We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. I love this quote from Phil Riken, where he says, they're perverting the doctrine of election. They thought that belonging to the covenant community meant never having to say that they were sorry. But these were false confidences. That they were children of Abraham did not mean that they would be saved automatically. So he's saying, don't be too proud of your status. Don't be too proud of your heritage. And, and what is something that would be a lot of in the desert region around the Jordan? Not just snakes, but stones, right? There's everywhere. So he's using images that they would have seen abundantly. He's like, look at all these stones, right? God could raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Now, again, is he saying that God is going to replace Israel with these stones, or God is going to replace Israel with the church? Does he say that? No. no. He's able. That's the key. He, he's not, the point is not to say, is somebody like, well, okay, you know, Israel got their shot. Now in the, we, we have our own thing here. It's saying that you know, the God doesn't need them. They might think that God needs them, that they're the promised people and they're going to be the solution. But he's saying, no, God doesn't need you. There is true, so true, that not all of ethnic Israel is actually Israel. They're not all following Christ. So the real ones are going to hear this and repent. So let's, let's think before we go on. How do people wrongly put their trust in their family today? How do they put their faith in their salvation in their family today? Yeah. Just because. Oh yeah. My 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 grandfather was a pastor. Therefore, I'm I'm good, right? Yeah. Sorry, Catholic could also be too mm. you know, been in the history of it. You go to Catholic church, you go to Catholic schools, family Catholic. Yeah. It's perhaps one of the greatest danger of pastor's kids that I always look over for is that, you know, the, the goal is to make mom and dad happy. And so we do spiritual things. We talk about spiritual things. We say we love God because um, like what, what child doesn't want their parent to be pleased with them, right? And it's like, but it's not, that that's the wrong place. You say, no, it has to be, God, not just mom and dad. There's a thin line there because God does want us to obey your parents. But that's always something I'm, I'm trying to explain to my kids. It's not just about me. I, I don't want you to make me happy. I want you to be truthful. And I want you to make, I want you to serve God. So he's warned them, don't trust in the religious activity of baptism. Don't just trust in your family. And third, don't presume on God's patience. He says, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Judgment's coming, and he uses very strong imagery. This is not the image of a woodsman who, like, he's like, all right, I got my axe. You know, beautiful axe. Walk out, and I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to start cutting this tree down. It's, you know, let's begin the process. I've got to, you know, wipe my hands off and and begin a little cut here. No, no, the image is one who's already done the preliminary work. You, you know how they actually have to 
chop in on both sides first before they actually knock it finally down. You don't just go straight through. <laughs> so this, so this, this is the final step. And so you have here a picture of this is a area where the trees are fully out and then when they've been cleared. He's saying the clearing is about to take place. It's soon. And, and people have always thought that since I've done something and nothing bad's happened to me yet, I'm going to get away with it, right? In Romans 2, Paul addresses this. Romans 2, verse 3. He says, Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things, that you do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and the forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Romans 2, 3 through 5. God's patience is a kind gift giving us time to turn from our sin and towards God. And, and he's saying a fire is coming, right? And so I, one of the things we keep saying when we're talking about John the Baptist is John the Baptist is really good about addressing the problem first. He's trying to bring conviction of sin before he gives the gift of the gospel, that forgiveness is available. And, and you can't really solve a problem in, if you don't point out the problem. John Calvin, um, who was one of the early reformers, he was talking about the issues of what they were trying to reform. And, and writing on this passage, in these harsh words, he says, most certainly, if you compare the Pope and his abominable clergy with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the mildest possible way of dealing with them will be to throw them all into one bundle. Those whose ears are so delicate that they cannot endure to have any bitter thing said against the Pope must argue not with us, but with the Spirit of God. He, he's saying, he's like, you compare, like, people don't want to say bad things about the Pope, but he's like, if we do not say what they are doing wrong, we are going against the very words of God. We're going against what the Holy Spirit brought through the Apostle John. So, let's try to answer this then. What kind of dangers exist for easy believism that has no walk to the talk? What kind of dangers exist for the person, for the church, for life of easy believism where there is no walk to the talk, where there is no repentance to my religious acts, my family acts, my, oh, nothing's going to happen idea. Yeah, Victor. Self-deceived. Self so how, how could someone be self-deceived then? Yeah. Okay, give a bad name. Mm -hmm. Because people see what they're doing and they don't see any difference. And they, they say, well, why would I want that? Why? You know? Yeah. Like, why, why would I? It, it, makes, it makes Christ look bad, like we said yeah. last week, right? Do you think it would affect um, or impact the body of Christ? Mm -hmm. it, there's new believers that are new in their faith, and they're exposed to someone who is acting like this. That can be a bad role model. Mm. model. Yeah. And thinking that, well, that's okay, and that's okay, but these people are doing it. They've been Christian longer. That must be okay. So that puts a kind of a poisonous thing to the body of Christ. Mm. Every person can point to some pastor, elder, Sunday school teacher, leader, and be like, oh, yeah, so-and-so did this. That's okay for me to do it, too, then, right? Yes, I know. No accountability. Mm-hmm. All to themselves. Yeah. And why, does, why is that a bad thing, Inez, to have no accountability? Because it's not, it's not 
you're not trusting in the Almighty God of life. Yeah. You're putting up your own mm. acceptance in a decision. Yeah. That's easy for me to say. Yeah. Accepts you the way you want to. Nancy, yeah. Acting that way, doesn't matter how much I teach the word of God, but I'm acting differently. They're not going to believe what I say. Hmm. And they're going to grow up not believing God. Yeah. That's a very dangerous thing. Yeah. So, again, I'm not perfect. I said, I mean, the best thing is I, I yeah. apologize to them. Yeah. I said, I get stopped. When I was in the car one time, somebody caught me over, and I was like, really angry. And, and I have to I have to repent before that because I, I need to let them know I was wrong and I had to do it right there. So I can see it can be very dangerous mm. as a parent. Yeah. And, and I, I I'd argue like the the whole problem with the crowds here and the and their leaders, the Pharisees, is not that they were sinners going about sinning it out, but they were self-righteous. They were saying, we don't sin. Sorry, Eric, you were going to say something. Oh, I, was, I was going to say the, the, the self-harm is, is that you've lost a relationship with God. Yeah. And, and you, you stop depending on it. Yeah. And, and that's actually, aside from harm to the church, it's the direct harm to you yourself. You deny yourself that relationship. Mm. I think I'll need to Races, it could be the first one could be is not true independence, mm. and the second one, the most important, which you cannot reverend fear to God. Mm. When you have reverend fear to Him, you think you know what to do before the right to you say so. Yeah. So, I have so many things in my life, and I told you just a short of things. One of my friends to work. I was working in the OR for many years. The only time they see a body over the, the table in the OR, always I thought about majesty, what God empowered by. And then I thought, oh Lord, how grand is your power? And where are we, our soul, our existence going? when the patient is sent the table in the OR mm. and the other people manipulate them to fix it. And then the persons come back from the anesthesia and they say, where is that person's heart? Where is the where is the spirit? Always I was thinking about that. So for me, I'm not perfect. I make many mistakes. But always I when I saw another human beings in front of me, always I think He's created by God. Yeah. So that made me my reverence to him. Mm. To no matter what person it is, maybe I like it, don't like it, maybe it's ugly person. It's not my business. I have to be reverence to the Lord mm. first. And so this is the key word, it's just more like a true repentance mm. and um, and pray to him with mm. reverence to help us mm. to be better for the new groups or bring more people to his kingdom. Mm. You were saying that even the, the repentance is even in our at, our thinking in our mind, how we think about the change of mind. Yeah, because the change of mind. Paul, Paul said in Romans 8, and he saw they fight the same thing. He said, You have to change your mind, your carnal mind, to your spiritual mind. So mm. it's a process, it's not, it's not easy. Yeah. You have to every day, every mm. moment, because your emotions are going to explode yeah. and then you realize that you make a mistake. So it's, it's a process, but mm. the only way that you can change is just bending your knee. Yeah. I think this brings out an important issue that as, as Christians, Bible-believing Christians, we're not moralists who our only goal is to make good people because we know they're not good people. We're not good people. We are sinners, but we also don't say, well, you never say anything bad then. Like we have to bring out the standards and here's what God's standard is. And as we are 
corrected by that standard, then we know how much more we need that Savior, that we need that changed heart. And we are constantly repenting people, not, you know, oh yeah, you know, just, just say a good word, you're, you're fine, you know, God knows you're trying kind of mindset. Like, no, we must constantly strive because judgment is real. Now, the second part, verses 10 through 14, God, through John, gives an exhortation for real faith. Verse 10 says, The crowds asked him, What then shall we do? And he answered them, Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none. Whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. So the leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they got really upset with John's rebuke of them. In Luke chapter 7, verse 30, we read that the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the purpose of God for themselves, not having been baptized by John. So they come, they bring all these people, and they go, what did you just call us? You just, you just call us vipers? Forget this. We're going back to Jerusalem. But the people go, well, what, what should we do? Like, you're, you're right. Like, we, we, we have sinned. We, we are sinners. And they, they are worried, right? So, so they want to hear. And so this, this is not a statement of, what, what can I do to be good enough? But they're a statement of, well, what are we doing wrong? Like, how can we, how can we honor God with our lives? What, what should we be doing, right? Like, this is a sorrowful group. And he says, first off, verse 11, you need to be a giver. You need to be giving to others. The, the tunic, this is, this is a statue in a um, museum in Jerusalem. The tunic was the undergarment worn under the cloak. So it was, it was like what you would take off, what you would still have on you in, when it was hot out. Food is obviously a need. So tunic is necessary because you need clothing to protect your body. Food is necessary because everyone needs to eat. And this is the second, or the second half of the Ten Commandments to love your neighbor as yourself. It's love and charity, giving to others. And it's interesting because he goes right at this, doesn't he? He deals with the issue of giving to others, not because it's a higher value than worshiping God, but because it testifies to the true religion of men in a way. And it, it detects and brings out hypocrisy about from those who boast with their mouths but are actually distant from their heart. Exactly. Like, wh why does caring for others reveal hypocrisy in religious people? Why does having to care for others and give to others reveal hypocrisy in religious people? Because they won't want to. They won't want to. Why, why don't they want to, Lynn? Because their hearts aren't changed. Yeah. It's false. So their hearts aren't changed. What, what do they want instead, everyone? They want it for themselves, they right? God releases people from themselves, but to, and His Holy Spirit makes us love and want to give. Yeah. If you're in it for yourself, you don't want to give to others. In, in John, 1 John 3, 17, John wrote, If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? First John 3, 17. He's like, if, if you see your brother and you're like, nope, I don't care about him. I, and there's a difference between even being like, well, I, I don't know if I can help him exactly the right way or, you know, what, what can I do? There's some question there. But it's, if you close off your heart to him, he's like, God's love isn't in you. Proper faith works out in caring for others especially, as Galatians 6 says, the household of faith, other Christians, were to give. 
Secondly, he says, be honest. Verse 12 through 13. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, John here is speaking to them who, uh, those who are around them, probably asking them to fulfill the Old Testament commands, which be to fellow Israelites. Um, and, you know, in passages like James it says that if you see your brother or sister in need, mm -hmm. but like the Galatians also says, do good to all people and especially those of the household of faith. So I would argue that we are to do good and kind to believers and non-believers alike, but especially all the more focused on our Christian family. That, that's the highest priority. And you know, if you can only help anyone, you help your, you help your Christian family first. But usually that's not our limit most of the time. Yeah, the Good Samaritan is a great example of that. Helping someone who, who probably hated him. So tax collectors come up here. Here's a picture of a booth tax collecting of a stone part in, um, in third century AD. But this is the kind of the idea of passing back things and forth. And so the tax collectors come to him and they say, well, teacher, what should we do? And he says, collect no more than you are authorized to do. Now, the Romans controlled Israel but there were not enough Romans to do everything. And so they would farm out the taxing rights to the highest bidder. Whoever says, I can get the most money for you, that person would give Rome the amount that he bid, and then he would collect more than that to pay his expenses so he could have a profit. And the Romans typically hired someone who was a local because they would know the land, they would know the people, they would know how to squeeze the people best. And, and these are probably not the chief tax collectors like Nicodemus, who is called a chief tax collector. These are the lower end ones because the chief tax collectors, they would, it's like a pyramid scheme where they would, they would go to, to Rome and say, we'll get you this much money. Okay. How am I going to get that much money? I'm going to get my lower tax collectors to, to do it for me, but then they have to bring that much money to me. And then they have to charge a little bit more than what they owe the top guy so that they make some money and you see how it expands. And John doesn't say to the tax collectors, stop working for a corrupt government, right? He doesn't say stop being a tax collector. He says to do what? Stop being corrupt. Themselves. Stop being corrupt to only take what? What they are owed or authorized to do. He said, don't be an extorter. Now, remember, it's interesting that those Jewish religious leaders, they hated tax collectors. They were like, how could Jesus be in the same room as one? They were ceremonially unclean. They were excluded from all religious activities. And yet John baptizes the tax collectors and says, be honest in your work. Think, are there any jobs today that are looked down upon, but are not sinful? which Christians can do. Like the jobs that people are like, oh, that's, that, that's a disrespectful job. That's not so good, but it's, it's a complete, but if you do it correctly and honoring, it's not bad. <clears throat> Could be an undertaker. Yeah, people get disgusted by death, but hey, we need Christians who are undertakers. There's a guy at the seminary who, he was, uh, I think, an accountant, but I think it was like for MTV or something. Um, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like a super like Christian organization, yeah. but he was just, uh, you know, count the money and make sure, and he did it honestly, of course, but he, he, he didn't tell people that he worked for MTV or whatever it was, it was something like that, because he knew that they, someone might say, why are you, why do you work for them, you know? Um, but I imagine it'd be kind of like the way that people view tax collectors, like, why are you working for a godless government? How can you even be a, a, a true Jew working for the Romans? Yeah. How can you be a, a Christian who worked for you know, MTV, which is peddlers of, you know, and start listing all the junkers on MTV? Yeah. He is responsible for every 
It's kind of a piece of, you know, cultural trash. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> could, could you be a Christian and work for Governor Newsom? Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully there's some Christians in his, in his circles who can, who can speak truth to him. Maybe, maybe, what? I know, I know. You're like, maybe, maybe they're not the decision makers. But a Christian can do that. We need Christians in those places. We need Christians in government. Um, it's hard. Don't get me wrong. Like that, you'd be very careful. But he's saying, be honest. Don't get pulled in to that nonsense. Don't get pulled into some, and and you gotta you gotta imagine people would be constantly going, but like, hey, you could make so much more money if you just squeeze people a little bit more. You could you could have this nice house and think of all the nice things you could do for people with your nice house. John says, if you believe, only do what you're allowed to. Do what's right. Be honest with what the taxes that are owed. You know, uh, as I think about that. I mean, John is telling them to be persecuted by Romans for not, you know, fleecing the people, and also be persecuted by the Jews for being a traitor. So I feel like he's kind of putting them in a bad spot, but he's saying, but if you can be a Christian and be persecuted by the Jewish people and you can be persecuted by the Romans, maybe that's not a bad place to be to keep you as a witness mm. to, to both. It's, a, it's kind of a harsh thing to tell them to, to, you know, really essentially say, you know, stay in this position where no one's going to like you. Rome's not going to like you. Jews are not going to like you. You're not going to, you know, make a ton of money, but stay there. It, it's actually more I think about it, the more shocking it is. That them that. And do, do the job well yeah. without abusing it, without getting any of the perks. He's like, do the job without without the all the lavish perks that people usually take advantage of. The blessing of it must be greater than yeah. the persecution or the you know, evil scene or anything like that. Mm. It's crazy, man. His last comment is to the soldiers in verse 14, where he tells them, be just. Verse 14, soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation and be content with your wages. Of course, the soldiers of Rome known well. This is a cool um, uh, picture of uh, a current day Roman um, exhibit. They're gathering together to just show off their armor. Um, and he, he says, to them be content with your wages uh, soldiers were given both land um, and opportunity but also wages but what often happened from soldiers in the roman era is they would not just take the wages they got from the government they would take protection money or they would oh yeah hey we arrested this guy and let's steal all his stuff at the same time and they would constantly be grabbing money there's all kinds of ways they would get extra money on the side because they could and who was going to question a roman soldier and if they did all your other roman soldiers would back you up every single time so if these roman soldiers feared god they were to again look down your bible verse 14 do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation. Don't be an extorter. Don't try and get money. And the way you're going to do that is contentment. He says the root behind the issue is contentment. Be content with what you have. I know oh, John is not getting into everything in their lives that he could. This is a public statement. He is just calling them and giving them an example of what it means to turn. Uh, and and I, I think, too, we often need to say, here are some specific examples of what it looks like to follow God. I, I think I've mentioned to some of you who've been here a while, you know, the fact that I was doing um, 
a evangelistic ministry at a drug and alcohol rehab center up in Los Angeles. I remember we were talking to some guys about what the Bible says, and one of the guys was just like, wait, you're saying I'm not supposed to live with my girlfriend. Yeah, that, that is exactly what we're saying. And he was just like, what? So like, like the, the thought had never even occurred to him that a Christian wasn't supposed to do that. And here he was saying that he was a Christian now, and he's like, what? And so we, we are supposed to kindly lay out steps of repentance rather than just saying, hey, dude, you should be following Jesus. O okay, what, what does it mean to follow Jesus, right? Like those steps are very helpful. And, and I think I, I was reading this, and I'll, I'll try and wrap it up here, is repentance is helpful. And I found these three steps to repentance. It, it's the process of turning to Christ and away from sin. Fleeing influences that distract us from Jesus. And so we had to know what those are. So to make this turn, first, three part, remember who you are in Christ and reach out to him. In Jesus, we are forgiven. We are chosen. We are holy and beloved. We're not just a sinner. Now, one issue that I think is rightly put up against you know, Alcoholics Anonymous and all the anonymous programs is they all say, hi, my name is Chris and I'm a alcoholic, right? And you're like, no, you're not. That's not your identity. You are a Christian. And as long as you keep your identity based on your sin, you're like, oh man, I'm just an angry person or, or I'm, I'm just a um, serial adulterer or I'm just a murderer, and that's all I ever will be. Well, of course you can't turn away from it. We must first see Christ. Then secondly, we need to remember we need help. Reach out to other people. Galatians 6 1 says, bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Like we need each other to bear each other's burdens. So you need to get other people in role. That's why we need the church. So we need to tell people in the church, you, know, you don't have to tell everyone, but someone's got to know, hey, I'm really struggling in this. Like, I need to say, I'm not doing well in this area. Please pray for me. Accountability was already brought up, right? Asking people. But then third, perhaps most importantly, is identify your triggers and prepare for how you will respond beforehand. Triggers are the events or circumstances that produce the kind of discomfort that pulls a struggler in. They're, they're, they tempt us. And it's interesting because John is saying this here. John is not saying just don't extort, don't threaten. He says, be content. Because if you, you understand the, the pathway, if a Roman soldier is constantly frustrated because, you know, like, ah, Rome doesn't pay me enough for all this. Oh, man, my life is so hard. My family is off here. And you're constantly thinking about your discontentment. And then Satan brings along an opportunity to get a little bit of extra money by doing a little bit of extortion on the side. What is that Roman soldier probably going to do? It's, they're going to fall into it because they've been focusing on it. But if they are just content, they're like, look, you know what? God has given me what I need. It's not everything I want, but I trust it's what I need. And this is the idea, is we need to fight the sin behind the sin. We have to fight the sin behind the sin that's leading to it. I love this quote by Rosaria Butterfield. Rosaria Butterfield, I, I keep quoting from her a number of times, but she says, we need to respond to the sin by fleeing. She says, don't admit sin as a kind of benign visitor. Confess it as an evil offense and put it out. You cannot domesticate sin or temptation patterns by admitting it into your home. Don't make a false peace. 
if you bring a baby tiger into your house, buy it a collar and leash it and name it Fluffy, don't be surprised if you wake up one day and Fluffy is eating you alive. <laughs> I love that. That's how sin works. And Fluffy knows her job. And too often, this is exactly what we do when it comes to repentance, where we're like, well, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, but you know what? I'm going to keep it close. We have these pet sins that we're like, I don't want to do that, but, but maybe just a little bit, because if I don't do it a little bit, then... And John is calling them, not to easy believism that just says, oh, I'm fine. He's calling them to repent, to be different from the world. So let's wrap up with this. Someone comes to you and they say, man... I'm lying. I'm lying all the time. I'm lying to my friends. I'm lying to my boss. I'm lying to my, to my coworkers. I'm lying to my neighbors. What are steps of repentance? What, can, what kind of examples can you give them to do besides just telling them stop lying? Because they know they're not supposed to lie, right? They know they're not. And they're saying, what can I do? What kind of things can we give them? Steps of repentance to turn from lying. Yeah, I know. Mm. No. Resist. You have to be active. No. You have to do something. No. Resist. And, and there's the hope. You have to give them the hope, too, of saying, if you resist, Satan will flee. The greatest lie is just like, I, I, I have to give in. I have to do it. If I don't do it, here's all these bad things that will happen. And you're, or if I, if I don't, yeah, if I don't lie, all these bad things are going to happen. And you're like, no, resist the devil. He will flee. Say no. You can say no. Okay? Yeah. That's a great hope. What else? Sylvia. Yeah. He said, do not One day I heard his um, uh, his testimony and he said he was the more bigger liar alive. Mm. He for everything he lied over and over and over again. Even he lived his whole life. And then uh, and he prayed very hard to try to take it away from that one from him. And uh, he was already convicted, you know, converted, and he's keeping lying sometimes. That he ran away immediately when he like said, you know what, stop what I said to you is a lie. Mm. Please forgive me. Yeah. And he said that that is the way how he fight. Yeah. With his that because he prayed that and he confessed yeah. immediately. He so confessed you know and he admitted it. He, he admitted right. it and he confessed right away. He said, You know what I said to you? That was a lie. Yeah. Please forgive me. And he said that he did that one over and over again. So and then I cannot even believe it. A guy like him, if you listen to him, he is now as a liar for so many people. Mm. He said that was one of the most bigger things to fight with. Yeah. Right. All of us have those kinds of sins, right? So, so just confess. Yeah. So know you know you can beat it. Confess it right away. Just say say I say I was wrong. Ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. And what else, Victor? Encourage first not to give the rest of the Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. You, you're forgiven, and if you lie to me, I'll forgive you. Like one of the, one of the worst, worst. Or I say maybe it's the best lie of Satan. One of the best lies of Satan is you're already dirty. What's the point in one more? Now, you've already lied so much. What's the point in one more lie? Just go and do it. There's no point in resisting. And you're like, no, like you're forgiven in Christ. You don't have. You're clean. So stay clean, right? Yeah. Telling other people, you know, I am wrestling with lying, so mm. if you hear me, if I'm really lying, <laughs> tell, call me out on it. You know, I'm giving you permission to, to say, is that true? <laughs> and then uh, really hold me to that to tell you the truth. And also, like Ephesians talks about, you know, put away falsehood uh, and speak the truth uh, with your neighbor. And so to maybe make a habit of. You know, again, maybe you tell your, your, your friend, you know, if I lie to you, or if I say anything, you 
you please ask me, is that is that true? Hold me accountable. And also make sure, uh, maybe ask them to ask you, you know, things that are true. I mean, just to get you in a habit of speaking things that are true. The Word of God is true, so maybe there's some scriptures that uh, you can replace some of those lies with. So it depends on the kind of things that you're lying about. Yeah. But you know, maybe there's some biblical truth to replace that with. Maybe have someone uh, hold you accountable to that. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you if you made a habit of, of lying, the response must be okay. Now you need to make a habit of speaking the truth. So you know you need to, like you need to go and, and practice speaking the truth to people consistently, telling people you know here's what's really going on, or pointing things out that are true. Just practice saying the truth all the time to change the habit. Repentance. I think again, this 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 kind of thing is what we we need to do as a church when we are in, we care about each other's spiritual lives enough to not just say, "Well, you need to be better," or not just say, "Well, just believe," but to say, "Hey, I want I want to help you. I want to you know do do you want some ideas of maybe some ways to repent and fight this?" Um, you know, not all of us are going to be John coming out and saying, all right, this is what you need to do. Um, but they came to him, and he was ready for an answer. And we need to be ready for answers when people come to us as well, not just to, you know, glib, easy fixes. But say, actually, this, I think Pastor Jerry brought up a great point. Like, this, this is going to be hard to live as a tax collector who is honest it's going to be hard to live as a soldier when everyone else is taking advantage of the system and you're like, nope, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be just. That's going to be hard, but it's going to be worth it. And 